We are very privileged this evening um, to have with us Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes's daughter, Frida Hughes, who is going to read Josephine Hart's introductions to this very special hour. I'll just tell you a little bit about Frida. Um, she was born in London and she herself is a painter and poet. She has written several children's books, eight collections of poetry, and was the Times poetry columnist from 2006 to 2008. She's judged numerous poetry competitions, chair judge of the Forward Prizes for Poetry and the National Poetry Competition, among others. Her first collection of po poetry, Wurraloo, was named after the hamlet she lived in in Australia, Western Australia, in the 90s. It received a Book Society special commendation. Other collections followed Stone Picker, Waxworks, 45, The Book of Mirrors, and Alternative Values. Um, now, the two driving forces in her life are her painting as well as her poetry, and the subject of her poems informed accompanying abstract images in oil on canvas. And that was published by Blood Axe Books in 2015, and it gave some very personal insights into her life. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, The London Magazine, The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Times, The Spectator, Tatler, and so it goes on. As a painter, she regularly exhibits in London. Her most recent exhibition was in November 2018, where she exhibited the first 100 abstract images of a 400-image project, um, illustrating 400 days of her diary. And the, the works are 410 by 14-inch oil on canvas paintings. And they are making something positive out of difficult days, including a family death and a personal illness. And of course, great joy and happiness are included. Her recent selected, uh, selected poetry collection, Out of Ashes, was published by Blood Axe Books and contains poems from all the previous collections. Frida's autobiographical poetry collection, 45, is published in paperback and will be published in the States as well. Um, in 2015, Frida stepped out of her totally artistic life and trained as a, as a counsellor and she works part-time counselling students at a local high school. She lives in Wales with owls and motorbikes. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. <laughs> and um, next to Frida, we have Sophie Cookson. Sophie is back, having read, for those of you who are here from Milton's Paradise Lost, having read Eve with us last year. And she's just finished filming The Trial of Christine Keeler for BBC One, where she plays Christine, and has recently been seen on the big screen in Red Joan, playing a young Judy Dench. She trained at the Oxford School of Drama and is perhaps best known for her role as Roxy in Kingsman 1 and 2. Um, and right beside me, lovely Eileen Walsh, whose most recent work is The Aristocrats by Brian Friel at the Don Mar and beginning David Elridge at the Gate Theatre in Dublin and TV Catastrophe, Melrose and Women on the Verge. Um, she's best known for The Maudlin Sisters and Disco Pigs. My huge thanks to Siobhan Wilder for um, bringing me down from Wales and actually getting me here. I think she had to dig me out. Um, what I need to tell you before I start is that the words I'm reading aren't mine. They're Josephine Hart's. So I am stepping into Josephine's shoes for the evening and I will be talking about myself in the third person. It's probably the only way I could do it because it's obviously this whole story is deeply personal to me. So you have to look at me and you have to think, these are Josephine Hart's words. <laughs> um, and we're going to start at the, um, well actually we're going to start at the end of my mother's life and work through. At the time of her death in 1963, Age 30, Sylvia Plath had published just one collection of poems, The Colossus, and one novel, The Bell Jar, if not to indifference, then certainly to no great acclaim. Yet she is now and has been for many years quite rightly hailed as a major 20th century poet. Her work and her life, and rarely has the life of a writer been more intertwined with the work, challenge us artistically, psychologically, philosophically, and morally. They are the subject of endless essays, books, and a film. How did this happen? 
this quite extraordinary posthumous fame, this acknowledged position in the literary pantheon from which I doubt she will ever be dislodged. The catalyst was the aerial poems, many of them written in the autumn of 1962, after she had separated from her husband, the poet Ted Hughes. They are, she wrote to her mother, the poems which will make my name. She was right. They were discovered by Ted Hughes after her death in February 1963, edited by him and published by Faber and Faber in 1965. Eliot wrote, When reading reading poetry, when I want to know, is it genuinely, possibly great, I ask myself, has this poet something to say a little different from what anyone has said before? And has the poet found not only a different way of saying it, but the different way of saying it which expresses the difference in what he is saying? The answer with Plath in both subject matter and its realization, as you will hear this evening, is an emphatic yes. Sylvia Plath was born on the 27th of October, 1932, in Jamaica Plain, Boston, Massachusetts, the first child. Their son, Warren, was born two years later to Otto Emil Plath, a Prussian immigrant, and Aurelia Schober Plath, who was of Austrian extraction, a high school teacher who had been Otto's pupil and was 21 years younger than her husband. Otto Plath was a professor of German at Boston University and a noted and published entomologist. Sylvia was to write many lovely, and some disturbing bee poems. This was a serious and academic household. In 1940, Sylvia's father, a diabetic, died from complications after surgery to amputate an infected leg, an infection which he'd stubbornly ignored till it was too late. This death and its appalling imagery devastated the eight-year-old Sylvia and a sense of fierce desolation Indeed, anger that this loss consumed her. The family moved house inland from the sea, a journey which had more than geographic resonance. Years later, Plath wrote, those first nine years of my life sealed themselves off like a ship in a bottle, beautiful, obsolete, a fine white flying myth. Her mother went back to teaching and took great pride in her pretty and brilliant daughter, who wrote poetry and understood her vocation from very early early on. At 16, Sylvia wrote, You ask me why I spend my life writing. Do I find entertainment? Is it worthwhile? Above all, does it pay? I write only because there is a voice within me which will not be still. Sylvia Plath attended Smith College, supported by a scholarship, where she was a huge success. She was socially a popular and outgoing student. She was on the board of the college, was shortlisted for poetry prizes, and was guest editor for the magazine Mademoiselle. Much of this early life became the inspiration for her semi-autobiographical novel, the bell jar, and her alter ego, Esther Greenwood. However, she also suffered from suffered severe depression, and her mother, aware that depression was endemic in Otto's family, sought treatment for her. Sylvia was given bipolar electroconvulsive shock treatment as an outpatient. In August 1953, when she was 21, she attempted suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills. And after six months of intensive therapy and analysis, which she was to continue on and off during her short life, she returned to Smith and to her highly successful academic life, winning a Fulbright scholarship to study at Newham College, Cambridge. Pause for a second and acknowledge the admirable, disciplined will at work here. This is courage which has been put to the test. 
Great strength of character is required to survive the sadness of losing, in shocking circumstances, one's father at eight, to fight the agonies of serious depression and to hold on and fight for one's dream of academic excellence and artistic fulfillment. This young woman was not, is, was not a victim. She was quite splendid, I think. In the autumn of 1955, she set sail for England. Nine months later, on the 16th of June, 1956, she married the poet, Ted Hughes. Of their meeting, she wrote to her mother, Aurelia, I shall tell you something most miraculous and thundering and terrifying. It is this man. I have never known anything like it. He has a health and a hugeness. The more he writes poems, the more he writes poems. Daily, I too, Ma, am full of poems. My joy whirls in tongues of words. I do not merely idolize, I see right to the core of him. I shall be a woman beyond women for my strength. I have never been so exultant. This is passion indeed. It is glorious. It is overwhelming, and this seems to me to be crucial. It exists between two very young people, Sylvia Plath, 23, and Ted Hughes, 25, and two high-minded, profoundly ambitious poets who wrote constantly and who were intensely supportive of each other, utterly dedicated to each other's success. Our first five poems were written in these years, 1956 to 59, years into which were packed intense creativity, passion, and marriage, a time of which she wrote, our lives fit together perfectly. He is so helpful and understanding. Spinster, in which there's a Freudian undernote concerning sexual repression. The Thin People concerns the hideous iconography of the Holocaust to which she was to return in later poems. Lorelei, in his notes to the collected poems of Sylvia Plath, Ted Hughes wrote, July 3rd session with an Ouija board. Sylvia Plath wrote of this session, among other penetrating observations, Pan said I should write on the poem subject Lorelei because they are my own kin. So today I did so for fun, remembering a plaintive German song my mother used to sing to me. The subject appealed to me doubly or triply. The German legend of the Rhine sirens, the sea childhood symbol, and the death wish involved in the song's beauty. The poem devoured my day, and I'm pleased with it. <laughs> Two views of a cadaver room. The Bruegel painting referred to in, is the triumph of death. When Philip Larkin reviewed Sylvia Plath's collected poems, edited by Ted Hughes and published in 1981, he said that he read them chronologically, and with the early poems he was impressed, as one would be with a prize student. But with the opening lines of two views from a cadaver room, he wrote, The day she visited the dissecting room, they had four men laid out, black as burnt turkey, already half unstrung. The shock is sudden. The possibility that she is trying a new style is dispelled. She has found her subject matter. Mushrooms. A superficially gentle poem filled with menace. And in Mushrooms, we hear for the first time an aspect of Plath's work, which is in pure poetic terms. It is power, which she brought to absolute perfection in the later poems. It is her deep connection to what Eliot called the auditory imagination and which he described thus. The feeling for syllable and rhythm, penetrating far below the conscious levels of thought and feeling, invigorating every word, sinking to the most primitive and forgotten, returning to an origin and bringing something back. 
fusing the most ancient and most civilized mentalities. As you listen to this poem, you can hear the almost military advance of the usually benign mushroom. And now to our first poem, Spinster. Spinster. Now this particular girl, during a ceremonious April walk with her latest suitor, found herself, of a sudden, intolerably struck by the bird's irregular babel and the leaves litter. By this tumult afflicted, she observed her lover's gestures unbalance the air, his gait stray uneven through a rank wilderness of fern and flower. She judged petals in disarray, the whole season sloven. How she longed for winter then, scrupulously austere in its order, of white and black, ice and rock, each sentiment within border, and heart's frosty discipline exact as a snowflake. But here, a burgeoning, unruly enough to pitch her five queenly wits into vulgar motley, a treason not to be born. Let idiots reel giddy in bedlam spring. She withdrew neatly. And round her house she set such a barricade of barb and check against mutinous weather as no mere insurgent man could hope to break, with curse, fist, threat, or love either. The thin people. They are always with us, the thin people. Meagre of dimension as the grey people on a movie screen. They are unreal. We say, it was only in a movie. It was only in a war making evil headlines when we were small that they famished and grew so lean and would not round out their stalky limbs again through peace, pummeled the bellies of the mice under the meanest table. It was during the long hunger battle they found their talent to persevere in thinness to come later into our bad dreams, their menace, not guns, not abuses, but a thin silence, wrapped in flea-ridden donkey skins, empty of complaint, forever drinking vinegar from tin cups, they wore the insufferable nimbus of the lot-drawn scapegoat. But so thin, so weedy a race could not remain in dreams, could not remain outlandish victims in the contracted country of the head any more than the old woman in her mud hut could keep from cutting fat meat out of the side of the generous moon when it set foot nightly in her yard until her knife had paired the moon to a rind of little light. Now the thin people do not obliterate themselves as the dawn, greyness, blues, reddens and the outline of the world comes clear and fills with colour. They persist in the sunlit rooms, the wallpaper, frieze of cabbage roses and cornflowers pales under their thin-lipped smiles, their withering kingship, how they prop each other up. We own no wildernesses rich and deep enough for stronghold against their stiff battalions. See how the tree boles flatten and lose their good browns. If the thin people simply stand in the forest, making the world go thin as a wasp's nest and grayer, not even moving their bones. Lorelei. It is no night to drown in. A full moon, river lapsing black beneath bland mirror sheen. The blue water mists dropping, scrim after scrim like fishnets, though fishermen are sleeping. The massive castle turrets doubling themselves in a glass, all stillness. Yet these shapes float up toward me, troubling the face of quiet. From the deer they rise, their limbs ponderous with richness, hair heavier than sculptured marble. They sing of a world more full and clear than can be. Sisters, 
Your song bears a burden too weighty for the walled ears listening here in a well-steered country under a balanced ruler. Deranging by harmony, beyond the mundane order, your voices lay siege. You lodge on the pitched reefs of nightmare, promising sure harbourage. By day, descant from borders of hebitude, from the ledge also of high windows. Worse even than your maddening song, your silence. At the source of your ice-hearted calling, drunkenness of the great depth. O oh, river, I see drifting, deep in your flux of silver, those great goddesses of peace. Stone, stone, bury me down there. Two views of a cadaver room. The day she visited the dissecting room, they had four men laid out, black as burned turkey, already half unstrung, a vinegary fume of the death vats clung to them. The white-smocked boys started working. The head of his cadaver had caved in, and she could scarcely make out anything in that rubble of skull plates and old leather. A sallow piece of string held it together. In their jars, the snail-nosed babies moon and glow. He hands her the cut-out heart, like a cracked heirloom. In Bruegel's panorama of smoke and slaughter, two people only are blind to the Carrion army. He, afloat in the sea of her blue satin skirts, sings in the direction of her bare shoulder, while she bends, finger a leaflet of music over him, both of them deaf to the fiddle in the hands of the death's head shadowing their song. These Flemish lovers flourish, not for long. Yet desolation, stalled in paint, spares the little country foolish, delicate, in the lower right-hand corner. Mushrooms. Overnight, very whitely, discreetly, very quietly, our toes, our noses, take hold on the loam, acquire the air. Nobody sees us, stops us, betrays us. The small grains make room. Soft fists insist on heaving the needles, the leafy bedding, even the paving. Our hammers, our rams, earless and eyeless, perfectly voiceless, widen the crannies, shoulder through holes. We diet on water, on bland mannered, asking little or nothing. So many of us, so many of us. We are shelves, we are tables, we are meek, we are edible. Nudges and shovers in spite of ourselves. Our kind multiplies. We shall, by morning, inherit the earth. Our foot's in the door. The poems we are now going to read were written between 1959 and 1961 a time of exhilaration and joy and a growing tension and stress. In September 1959, after a stay in Boston with Ted Hughes, during which Sylvia Plath worked as a secretary in the Massachusetts General Hospital, she saw her old psychiatrist and attended a writing course by Robert Lowell. They spent some time at the artist colony Yaddo in Saratoga Springs, New York, and stayed there till November, Many of the poems for the Colossus were written there. Sylvia Plath discovered that she was pregnant and the couple returned to England. They needed to find a place to live. This was, as she described it, a cold and exhausting time. They found a tiny flat in Shalcott Square, London. In February 1960, Sylvia's collection, The Colossus, was accepted by Heinemann. In March 1960, Ted Hughes's collection, The Hawk in the Rain, won the Somerset Maugham Award. On April the 1st, 1960, their daughter Frida was born, an event celebrated in the beautiful morning song. Throughout 1960, much is happening. So much excitement, motherhood, extreme artistic endeavor, literary friendships, 
a dinner with T.S. Eliot, a working pattern which allows Sylvia to write in the mornings and Ted in the afternoons. Theirs is a passionate, possessive love. And though many genuine friends bore witness to Sylvia's sometimes desperate possessiveness, who has ever loved who is not possessive? And the life-changing experience of first-time motherhood leaves few women at their most sanguine. Then in February 1961, Sylvia suffered a miscarriage, followed, by a month, followed a month later by an appendectomy. Her various times in hospital feature in much of her work. In March, Ted Hughes's Lupercal wins the prestigious Hawthornden Prize, and in May, Knopf agreed to publish The Colossus in New York. In June, Sylvia Plath is pregnant again. <coughs> Their life seems crowded, almost overwhelming to me. Their flat is tiny, they have very limited financial resources, and they are each of them consumed by poetry and new parenthood. It is hardly surprising that the marriage comes under increasing strain. The Colossus is the title poem of her first collection, and deals with the increasingly powerful psychological position her dead father seemed to take at this fevered time in her life, a not uncommon occurrence after having had a child, a position which reached its apotheosis in daddy. Leaving early with its compelling opening line, Lady, your room is lousy with flowers is a monologue written from a man's point of view about the flowers in someone's <laughs> upstairs room. In Plaster, demonstrates plasmordant wit and is, I think, also a metaphor for constriction and the desire to break free, which is a motive in her work at this time. Morning Song, with what has to be one of the loveliest, most joyful lines in her work, written in celebration of her daughter Frida's birth, love set you going like a fat gold watch. We start with the Colossus. In January 1962, Sylvia Plath gave birth to her son, Nicholas, and the Hugheses decided to move out of London to Court Green in Devon, the house in which Ted Hughes would live for most of his life. With that decision, their lives tragically linked with that of Asia Wevel, who came with her husband to buy the flat in Shalcott Square, and who would herself commit suicide in 1969, taking her daughter, Shora, with her. In the summer of 1962, Ted Hughes began an affair with Asia Wevel, and in August of that year, Sylvia Plath wrote to her mother, I hope you will not be surprised or shocked when I say I am going to get a legal separation from Ted. Marriage, wrote Iris Murdoch, is a very private place. In December 1962, Sylvia Plath moved to London with her family and took a flat, which to her delight had once been lived in by W.B. Yeats. She wrote to her mother, I am so happy. I shall be a marvellous mother and regret nothing, and endearingly I have found a fabulous hairdresser, and when I appear at the royal court, I shall be a knockout. <laughs> the weeks before Christmas cannot have been easy, yet in the last six weeks of her life she wrote The Arrival of the Bee Box, published in the Atlantic Monthly. In the last months of 1962 and in the early months of 1963, foundations were laid in poetry and in death for what became a most unprivate 20th century iconic relationship. Analyzed with savagery and stunning moral impertinence by many who wish to claim the poet for their own ends. Over the years, in reading essays and books and sometimes listening to other comments, there seems little pity, humility, or awe even, in the face of the catastrophic unfolding of a modern Greek tragedy. The family drew up the ramparts and imposed a silence for the protection of the two children. 
a decision which has always seemed to me to be an act of wisdom. This silence was not broken for over 30 years until Ted Hughes himself published the unforgettable Birthday Letters in 1998, the year of his own death, in which he wrote, One poem ends your story, my story. It is quite rightly described as one of the most important and powerful volumes of poetry published in decades. And now, The Colossus. The Colossus. I shall never get you put together entirely, pieced, glued, and properly jointed. Mule bray, pig grunt, and bawdy cackles proceed from your great lips. It's worse than a barnyard. Perhaps you consider yourself an oracle, mouthpiece of the dead or of some god or other. Thirty years now I have laboured to dredge the silt from your throat. I am none the wiser. Scaling little ladders with glue pots and pails of Lysol over the weedy acres of your brow to mend the immense skull plates and clear the bald white tumuli of your eyes. A blue sky out of the Oristia arches above us. Oh, Father, all by yourself, you are pithy and historical as the Roman Forum. I open my lunch on a hill of black cypress. Your fluted bones and acanthine hair are littered in their old anarchy to the horizon line. It would take much more than a lightning stroke to create such a ruin. Nights I squat in the cornucopia of your left ear, out of the wind, counting the red stars and those of plum colour. The sun rises under the pillar of your tongue. My hours are married to shadow. No longer do I listen for the scrape of a keel on the blank stones of the landing. Leaving early. Lady, your room is lousy with flowers. When you kick me out, that's what I'll remember. Me sitting here bored as a leopard in your jungle of wine bottle lamps Velvet pillows the colour of blood pudding, and the white china flying fish from Italy. I forget you, hearing the cut flowers sipping their liquids from assorted pots, pitchers, and coronation goblets like Monday drunkards. The milky berries bow down, a local constellation, toward their admirers in the tabletop. Mobs of eyeballs looking up. Are those petals of leaves you've parried with them? Those green stripped ovals of silver tissue. The red geraniums, I know. Friends, friends. They stink of armpits and the involved maladies of autumn. Musky as a love bed the morning after. My nostrils prickle with nostalgia. Henna hags, cloth of your cloth. They tow old water thick as fog. The roses in the Toby jug gave up the ghost last night. High time. Their yellow corsets were ready to split. You snored, and I heard the petals unlatch, tapping and ticking like nervous fingers. You should have junked them before they died. Daybreak discovered the bureau lid, littered with the Chinese hands. Now I'm stared at by chrysanthemums the size of Holofernes's head, dipped in the same magenta as this fubsy sofa. In the mirror, their doubles back them up. Listen, your tenant mice are rattling the cracker packets. Fine flour muffles their bird feet. They whistle for joy. And you doze on, nose to the wall. This mizzle fits me like a sad jacket. How did we make it up to your attic? You handed me gin in a glass bud vase. We slept like stones. Lady, what am I doing with a lung full of dust and a tongue of wood? Knee deep in the cold swamped by flowers? In plaster. I shall never get out of this. There are two of me now. This new, absolutely white person 
and the old yellow one. And the white person is certainly the superior one. She doesn't need food. She is one of the real saints. At the beginning, I hated her. She had no personality. She lay in bed with me like a dead body. And I was scared because she was shaped just the way I was. Only much whiter and unbreakable, with no complaints. I couldn't sleep for a week. She was so cold. I blamed her for everything, but she didn't answer. I couldn't understand her stupid behaviour. When I hit her, she held still, like a true pacifist. Then I realised what she wanted was for me to love her. She began to warm up, and I saw her advantages. Without me, she wouldn't exist. So, of course, she was grateful. I gave her a soul. I bloomed out of her as a rose blooms out of a vase of not very valuable porcelain. And it was I who attracted everybody's attention, not her whiteness and beauty, as I had first supposed. I patronised her a little, and she lapped it up. You could tell almost at once she had a slave mentality. I didn't mind her waiting on me, and she adored it. In the morning, she woke me early, reflecting the sun from her amazingly white torso, and I couldn't help but notice her tidiness and her calmness and her patience. She humoured my weakness like the best of nurses, holding my bones in place so they would mend properly. In time, our relationship grew more intense. She stopped fitting me so closely, and seemed offish. I felt her criticising me in spite of herself, as if my habits offended her in some way. She let in draughts and became more and more absent-minded. and My skin itched and flaked away in soft pieces, simply because she looked after me so badly. Then I saw what the trouble was. She thought she was immortal. She wanted to leave me. She thought she was superior and I'd been keeping her in the dark and she was resentful, wasting her days, waiting on a half corpse. And secretly, she began to hope I'd die. Then, She could cover my mouth and eyes, cover me entirely, and wear my painted face the way a mummy case wears the face of a pharaoh, though it's made of mud and water. I wasn't in any position to get rid of her. She'd supported me for so long, I was quite limp. (coughs) I had forgotten how to walk or sit, so I was careful not to upset her in any way or brag ahead of time how I'd avenge myself. Living with her was like living with my own coffin, yet I depended on her, though I did it regretfully. I used to think we might make a go of it together. After all, it was kind of a marriage being so close. Now... I see it must be one or the other of us. She may be a saint, and I may be ugly and hairy, but she'll soon find out that that doesn't matter a bit. I'm collecting my strength. One day I shall manage without her, and she'll perish with emptiness then and begin to miss me. Morning Song Love set you going like a fat gold watch. The midwife slapped your foot soles and your bald cry took its place among the elements. Our voices echo, magnifying your arrival. New statue. In a drafty museum, your nakedness shadows our safety. We stand round, 
blankly as walls. I'm no more your mother than the clouds that distills a mirror to reflect its own slow effacement at the wind's hand. All night, your moth breath flickers among the flat pink roses. I wake to listen. A far sea moves in my ear. One cry, and I stumble from my bed, cow-heavy and floral in my Victorian nightgown. Clean as a cat's. The window square whitens and swallows its dull stars. And now you try your handful of notes. The clear vowels rise like balloons. The arrival of the bee box. I ordered this clean wood box, square as a chair and almost too heavy to lift. I would say it was a coffin of a midget or a square baby. Were there not such a din in it? The box is locked. It is dangerous. I have to live with it overnight and I can't keep away from it. There are no windows, so I can't see what is in there. There is only a little grid, no exit. I put my eye to the grid. It is dark, dark, with a swarmy feeling of African hands, minute and shrunk for export, black on black, angrily clambering. How can I let them out? It is the noise that appalls me most of all the unintelligible syllables. It's like a Roman mob, small, taken one by one, but my God, together. I lay my ear to furious Latin. I am not a Caesar. I have simply ordered a box of maniacs. <laughs> they can be sent back. They can die. I need feed them nothing. I am the owner. I wonder how hungry they are. I wonder if they would forget me. If I just undid the locks and stood back and turned into a tree. There is the laburnum, its blonde colonnades, and the petticoats of the cherry. They might ignore me immediately in my moon suit and funeral veil, I am no source of honey, so why should they turn on me? Tomorrow, I will be sweet, God. I will set them free. The box is only temporary. In the autumn of 1962, in Court Green in Devon, Sylvia Plath, newly separated, her husband now living in London, wrote the poems for which she will be Ever, ever be remembered, the aerial poems. 40 poems in a two-month period. Though Sylvia Plath arranged her manuscript so that it began with the word love and ended with spring, they are the most shockingly powerful, wildly exhilarating and often frightening poems in literature. Larkin, in his essay on Plath, wrote, they exist in a prolonged, high-pitched ecstasy like nothing else in literature. He wondered had her own talent overwhelmed her, as he believed had happened with Lowell. Larkin, who kept life at a distance, poses a central question here. Is art dangerous to life? Eliot, remember, at the end of his life, said he believed he'd paid too high a price for poetry, that he'd suffered too much. Heaney answers the question. He describes her writing them in the early morning. She wrote them every morning and quotes from letters home. When my sleeping pill wears off, I am up about five, in my study, with coffee, writing like mad. Have managed a perm a day before breakfast. All book poems. Terrific stuff. As if domesticity had choked me. She woke, he writes, already composed into something intended. And he quoted Yeats in the, on those kinds of moments when the writer is complete, like a very efficient tool or weapon used and in demand from moment to moment. 
And he reminds us that for Yeats, the poet is somebody who is spoken through. The word persona comes from pers personare, meaning to sound through. It represents, wrote Heaney, the final stage of her artistic achievement, which obviously and notoriously was linked to developments in her psychological and domestic life. And though he believes that the very greatest poetry occurs when a certain self-forgetfulness is attained, he believes this limitation was the limitation of youth, and that it was precisely that huge personal need and the desire to bring expressive power and fully developed selfhood into congruence, which gives the poems what he called their pitch and scold. I have separated the four poems which will now be read from the very last two of the evening, Words and Edge, which we'll talk about after this helter-skelter journey of genius, full of force and velocity, because on going back and rereading the poems, it is clear that the change in the note must be marked. The poems going to be read now are The Applicant, A Monologue, The Speaker, Sylvia Plath wrote, is an executive who wants to be sure the applicant for his marvellous product will treat it right. Death and Co. is about the double or schizophrenic nature of, of death, the marmorial coldness of Blake's death mask and the fearful softness of worms. I imagine she wrote these two aspects of death as two men who have decided to call. Daddy, it's wild psychic energy controlled just by the true artist. She said of this poem, this is a poem by a girl with an Electra complex. Her father died while she still thought he was God. Its rhymes, are rhythms are seductive, overwhelming. Heaney, for all his admiration, feels it overdraws on our sympathy. Lady Lazarus. Plas said in a BBC reading, is about a woman who has the great and terrible gift of being reborn. The only trouble is, she has to die first. The applicant. First, are you our sort of person? Do you wear a glass eye, false teeth or a crutch? A brace or a hook? Rubber breasts or a rubber crotch? Stitches to show something's missing? No, no. Then, how can we give you a thing? Stop crying. Open your hand. Empty, empty. Here is a hand to fill it and willing to bring teacups and roll away headaches and do whatever you tell it. Will you marry it? It is guaranteed to thumb shut your eyes at the end and dissolve of sorrow. We make new stock from the salt. I notice you were stark naked. How about this suit? Black and stiff, but not a bad fit. Will you marry it? It is waterproof, shatterproof, proof against fire and bombs through the roof. Believe me, they'll bury you in it. Now your head, excuse me, is empty. I have the ticket for that. Come here, sweetie, out of the closet. Well, what do you think of that? Naked as paper to start, but in 25 years, she'll be silver, in 50 gold. A living doll everywhere you look. It can sew, it can cook, it can talk, talk, talk. It works. There's nothing wrong with it. You have a hole, it's a poultice. You have an eye, it's an image. My boy, it's your last resort. Will you marry it, marry it, marry it? Death and Co. Two. Of course there are two. It seems perfectly natural now. The one who never looks up, whose eyes are lidded and bald like Blake's, who exhibits the birthmarks that are his trademark, the scald scar of water, the nude verdigree of the condor, I am red meat, his beak claps sideways, I am not his yet. He tells me how badly I photograph, he tells me how sweet the babies look in their hospital icebox, a simple frill at the neck, then the flutings of their Ionian death gowns, then two little feet. He does not smile or smoke. The other does that. His hair long and plausive, 
bastard, masturbating a glitter. He wants to be loved. I do not stir. The frost makes a flower. The dew makes a star. The dead bell. The dead bell. Somebody's done for. Daddy. You do not do, you do not do anymore. Black shoe in which I have lived like a foot for thirty years, poor and white, barely daring to breathe or achoo. Daddy, I have had to kill you. You died before I had time, marble heavy, a bag full of God. Ghastly statue with one grey toe, big as a Frisco seal and a head in the freakish Atlantic where it pours bean green over blue in the waters of beautiful Norset. I used to pray to recover you. Ach du. In the German tongue, in the Polish town, scraped flat by the roller of wars, wars, wars. But the name of the town is common. My Polak friend says there are a dozen or two, so I never could tell where you put your foot, your root. I never could talk to you. The tongue stuck in my jaw. It's stuck in a barbed wire snare. Ich, 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 ich. I could hardly speak. I thought every German was you. And the language obscene. An engine, an engine, chuffing me off like a Jew. A Jew to Dachau, Auschwitz, Belsen. I began to talk like a Jew. I think I may well be a Jew. The snows of the Tyrol, the clear beer of Vienna, are not very pure or true. With my gypsy ancestress and my weird luck and my tarak pack and my tarak pack, I may be a bit of a Jew. I've always been scared of you, with your Luftwaffe, your gobbledygoo, and your neat moustache and your Aryan eye bright blue. Panzerman, Panzerman, oh you, not God, but a swastika, so black no sky could squeak through. Every woman adores a fascist. The boot in the face, the brute, brute heart of a brute like you. You stand at the blackboard, Daddy, in the picture I have of you. A cleft in your chin instead of your foot, but no less a devil for that. No, not any less the black man who bit my pretty red heart in two. I was ten when they buried you. At twenty, I tried to die and get back, back, back to you. I thought even the bones would do. But they pulled me out of the sack and they stuck me together with glue. And then I knew what to do. I made a model of you. A man in black with a Mein Kampf look and a love of the rack and the screw. And I said, I do, I do. So, Daddy, I'm finally through. The black telephone's off at the root. The voices just can't worm through. If I've killed one man, I've killed two. The vampire who said he was you and drank my blood for a year, seven years, if you want to know. Daddy, you can lie back now. There's a stake in your fat, black heart and the villagers never liked you. They are dancing and stamping on you. They always knew it was you. Daddy, Daddy, you bastard. I'm through. Lady Lazarus. I have done it again. One year in every ten, I manage it. A sort of walking miracle, my skin, bright as a Nazi lampshade. My right foot, a paperweight. My face, a featureless, fine Jew linen. Peel off the napkin, oh, my enemy. Do I terrify? The nose, the eye pits, the full set of teeth. The sour breath will vanish in a day. Soon, soon the flesh, the grave cave eight, will be at home on me. And I, a smiling woman, I am only thirty. And like the cat, I have nine times to die. This is number three. What a trash to annihilate each decade. What a million filaments the peanut-crunching crowd shoves in to see them unwrap me, hand and foot, the big striptease. Gentlemen, ladies, 
These are my hands, my knees. I may be skin and bone. Nevertheless, I am the same identical woman. The first time it happened, I was ten. It was an accident. The second time, I meant to last it out and not come back at all. I rocked shut as a seashell. They had to call and call and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Dying is an art, like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I've a call. It's easy enough to do it in a cell. It's easy enough to do it and stay put. It's the theatrical. Come back in broad day to the same place, the same face, the same brute, amused shout, a miracle that knocks me out. There is a charge for the eyeing of my scars. There is a charge for the hearing of my heart. It really goes. There is a charge, a very large charge for a word or a touch or a bit of blood or a piece of my hair or my clothes. So, so, hair doctor. So, hair enemy. I am your opus. I am your valuable, the pure gold baby that melts to a shriek. I turn and burn. Do not think I underestimate your great concern. Ash, ash, you poke and stir. Flesh, bone, there is nothing there. A cake of soap, a wedding ring, a gold filling, hair God, hair Lucifer, beware, beware. Out of the ash I rise with my red hair and I eat men like air. The two poems we're about to hear, <clears throat> Words and Edge, were written in January and early February 1963. Heaney said of Edge, here is a perfected economy of line, a swift, sure-handed marking of the time and space which had been waiting for this poem. In the midst of all the sadness, what we must never forget is Sylvia Plath's very great achievement and her triumph. On the 11th of February, 1963, having suffered flu as had her children, during one of the coldest January months on record, Sylvia Plath took her own life, of which her mother wrote, her energies have been depleted by illness, anxiety, and overwork. And although she had for so long managed to be gallant and equal to the life experience, some darker day than usual had temporarily made it seem impossible to pursue. And now for words. Words. Axes, after whose stroke the wood rings, and the echoes. Echoes travelling off from the centre like horses. The sap wells like tears, like the water striving to re-establish its mirror over the rock that drops and turns a white skull eaten by weedy greens. Years later, I encounter them on the road. Words dry and riderless, the indefatigable hoof taps, while from the bottom of the pool, fixed stars govern a life. We're going to finish on edge. The woman is perfected. Her dead body wears the smile of accomplishment, the illusion of a Greek necessity, flows in the scrolls of her toga. Her bare feet seem to be saying, we have come so far, it is over. Each dead child coiled a white serpent, one at each little pitcher of milk, now empty. 
she has folded them back into her body as petals of a rose close, when the garden stiffens and odours bleed from the sweet, deep throats of the night flower. The moon has nothing to be sad about, staring from her hood of bone. She is used to this sort of thing. Her plaques crackle and drag. Thank you very much.